Well, it's good to be back. I've, I've been here. How many people have heard me talk before? Okay. So does anybody want to do this for me? <laughs> now, I am, I'm really excited to, to be back here, um, not only uh, in the New England area, but at this conference center. It just is, is so nice. It's a nice size. This is a, a nice uh, a group size as well. So um, we're going to get through some slides here, hopefully, and um, hopefully, again, have some time for, for questions at, at the end. Um, Mary was adding things this morning. Oh, why don't you talk about this? Oh, why don't you talk about that? Um, so when I had the phone call with her, um, she said, well, you know, what are you doing now? Like, what could you talk about? And I said, well, you know, I'm working on mobility, I'm working on patient engagement, e-commerce, analytics. So, you know, we could talk about any one of those things. She said, I think we should talk about all of them. Um, so a little bit of a whirlwind tour of... Um, of what I think is, is happening uh, today, what I see that's changing in the industry, really beyond the electronic health record. Um, so right before I left ONC, I was coining the term meaningful use and beyond. And I think we can say the same thing about the EHR. You know, um, the EHR is laying the base and it's an extremely important base. But it's not everything when we think about health IT. So I'm going to talk about some um, a little slightly provocative things in, in some cases of, of other things that are probably things, and that didn't work. Does this work at all? Sometimes. Okay. <laughs> I can deal with sometimes. <laughs> I love this stuff when we're at a technology conference. I, yeah. Okay, I'm going to tell a funny story from lunch really quickly. I was, uh, you know, I, at Aurora, our email boxes were almost unlimited, and I liked it that way. Yes, sir? It's a left click. A left click? Yeah, it's a mouse. Oh. And so when I went to the government, they said, you only get a gig of email storage. And I was like traumatized, a gig. So then I went to IBM, and I have 300 meg. <laughs> and it's like, wait, what's up with this? You know, like, you, know, you, you kind of want to say, this doesn't make sense. You're a technology company. You build storage. Um, so when I was sort of mentioning that to somebody who's at a higher level than me, they just looked at me and said, you don't want to be the person who came to IBM and was complaining about email. And I thought, yeah, I do want to be that person. <laughs> so now I'm telling all of you so you can repeat the story and it'll get back to that person. Um, it is, it's, it's just interesting. It's a wonderful time to be in health IT. It's a wonderful time to be a nurse. Um, uh, so some of you are, are younger and some of you are my age. And you know, when we think about where we've come as a profession, and, you know, particularly over the last 10 years, I think it's exciting that our, our value um, to the team and the idea of team-based nursing has go gotten so um, important. And even to the point that you know, people are talking about collaborative education and meaning that we're gonna train together, right? It's not gonna be you know, physician education and nursing education, but in fact, we have to overlap, right? And understand how we work as a team with pharmacists and with dietitians and with OT, PT and speech people. And so I think that just really, really gets exciting for me. But what really gets me excited is the consumerism, and I'll talk a, a fair amount about that. So I'm gonna start out with just a little bit of health uh, healthcare landscape, probably nothing you haven't heard before or thought about yourself, but just to kind of set the stage. And then talk about how are we gonna leverage health IT beyond the her. Um, <laughs> yeah, didn't catch that one. Um, I think I'm gonna blame Mary. It was right when I sent it to Mary. Yeah, she's got my back, that's good. Um, so how does healthcare change with mobile? Now, this is gonna be an interesting one because what I'm talking about is not how does healthcare change with a 100 pound cart that you push around, okay? That's mobile, but that's like yesterday's mobile. Um, what I'm talking about is how are we gonna change healthcare the same way we have changed our lives with our mobile devices, okay? And you know, anybody who's been anywhere, I mean, on a bus, on a train, on a plane, sees exactly the behavior I'm talking about, and are, you participate in it, right? 
plane, you land, what's the first thing everybody does? Pull out the phone, turn it on. I mean, now you only have to put in airplane mode, you know, and depending on, you know. But it's, it's fundamentally changed our lives, the way we connect, the way we communicate, what we can get done. You know, um, you land in a new city, what do you do? You turn on the GPS, you use that. You know, somebody was telling me just the other day, you know, they don't go anywhere without their GPS. In fact, he said to me, I could be two blocks from my house and until I turned on my GPS, I wouldn't know how to get home. Um, and I thought, okay, that's a little scary, but you're 22, you know? Um, <laughs> but seriously, you know, when you really think about how this has changed our lives, you know, I, I have a daughter who lives in Singapore, and I remember she's been there for two years, and as she was moving, I was completely traumatized, you know? It's like, oh my God, she's gonna be so far away. Now, she lived in Colorado for eight years, and I was in Wisconsin, so it wasn't like we lived next door to each other. Um, but I was like practicing on Skype, you know? and. So she moves there, and two days after she moves there, my phone rings, and I pick up my phone, and she says, hi, Mom. And I'm like, Lauren? She goes, yeah. I said, why were we talking about Skype when you can call me, you know? <laughs> and she's like, well, there's an app for that. You know, now some of you might know there's a, a really good app for texting called WhatsApp, and there's a really good app for calling, um, which is Magic Jack, and it's using internet. You know, so it's like, free. You know, um, and I was like, oh my God. And it was just one small example of how different things are, you know, in a, a really positive way. And we need to think about how we can take that and apply it to healthcare. So I think mobile is just a really, really cool area. And then I've been, you know, really thinking about patient engagement and consumerism for probably the last, you know, five or six years of my career. Um, and I think it's going to a new level, and I'll talk a little bit about that, and then wrap up with uh, analytics and pop health and probably get you guys out of here by 4 o'clock, which is what I have, Mary, right, till 4? <laughs> okay, left mouth. Um, oh, I, I did want to say one thing. Um, a lot of people are talking about Watson, so I'll talk about that. There were some big announcements. You know, um, IBM formed a um, IBM... Uh, Watson Health, I have to make sure I say that right, um, where we're really taking the power of Watson, which is the computer that, of course, played Jeopardy. Um, I think it was quite a number of years ago now. I do remember, it's probably five years ago or so. Um, but it's cognitive computing, and we'll talk about that and how that fits in with um, some of the analytics things that, that folks are thinking about. Okay, so healthcare transformation is happening. It's being driven by, by shifts in expectations. You know, we're suddenly starting to say, gee, if we can do this in our private lives, or we can do this in retail, or we can do this uh, when we book flights or make hotel reservations. Why shouldn't we be able to take some of these uh, behaviors and incorporate them into our um, healthcare lives as well? So the expectations are, are beginning to change. It certainly is. Um, depends on the, the region. It depends on the uh, type of, of person. Um, I was trying to think the other day, when is the last time I went to a retail store and checked out with anything other than barcoding? Now, I don't know if this is a function of being old and forgetting, or if literally it's that long ago. I can't remember. Can anybody remember going to a grocery store or a retail store and they didn't have barcoding? Okay, so you know what our current, st how many of you have barcoding met administration? Yeah, so it's two-thirds. Pretty good. Okay, think about that, right? We can't even remember in retail when we didn't use barcoding and we don't have it in probably a, a quite more important area of our lives. So it, again, that's the expectations. Um, we're seeing lots of things going on in healthcare, particularly in the United States, in terms of the incidence of chronic disease, uh, changing lifestyles, uh, globalization of healthcare, the ability to actually pull things in um, from other countries or go to other countries to get healthcare. Um, we have resource shortages still, increased competition, and certainly a lot of advances in technology. So we're kind of going from you know old healthcare to new healthcare, um, from fee for service to pay for performance. Hopefully everybody was paying attention. I don't know if I just pay attention because I used to work at the government, um, but Sylvia Burwell, who's the current uh, Secretary of Health and Human Services, uh, about a month ago, you know, went on record as saying uh, that Medicare and Medicaid would be reimbursing. Um, healthcare, by 2016, 50% of their reimbursement was going to be by value instead of fee-for-service. 
um, and that by 2018 it would be up to 80%. And so this is a clear signal that this isn't a trend, this is something that's actually going to be, be happening. And um, of course that has all sorts of ramifications when we think about all the stuff that we potentially do that we might today get paid for because it's a whatever we do we get paid for. Um, or maybe you're in more of a diagnosis or a bundled kind of payment situation, but pay for value is still very clearly different in that you have to achieve the outcomes. And it really does bring in not just the illness outcomes, but it brings in the health outcomes, which I think is going to be um, particularly uh, helpful. So we're going from this volume to value, from delivery to outcome, um, from, and we'll talk about this in the consumerism section, but this idea of um, insurance is a right, and as soon as I get a job, I have insurance. Now, is anybody in that situation right now? Right? Everybody's contributing, right? And I heard statistics, and I haven't actually found this in writing yet, um, that high deductible plans are up to about 40%. And maybe another show of hands, how many people have high deductible plan? Because I'll raise mine. Um, yeah, it's a matter of math, right? You know, you're taking, um, if you actually do the math on a high deductible plan, your out of pocket will be the same at the end of the year um, because there's a max out of pocket. Um, but people that are doing that are becoming more discerning. And they're actually checking the price tag, if you will, of certain kinds of things. And it's driving their behavior in terms of filling prescriptions or where to have that test done. Um, and I would challenge you, if you have to have an x-ray the next time, call three different places and try to find out what the price is. You know? Yeah, good luck with that. Um, <laughs> but it is changing. It is changing. Um, and of course, because of this sort of right uh, of insurance that we've had going uh, for so long, uh, folks have not always been discerning consumers. And, and again, that's what's starting to change. So this price unknown to cost transparency. Um, and a one-way dialogue, like here's the three things you should do, to a two-way dialogue where the, the patient or the consumer is actually uh, engaged. Uh, transactional to brand loyal, data poor and disconnected to being rich in data, reactive to predictive and prescriptive, and standards to personalized and optimized. Um, and that last one is a really important one um, because we've just barely got to standardized. You know, best care, uh, evidence-based practice, if you will. And, and this idea now that, yeah, that's important, but it's really important to get personalized. Um, and we know that, for example, through genomics, that not all patients are going to react the same. So that's one component of personalized. But the other component of personalized is actually personalizing the experience to make sure that the patient or consumer has a good experience and wants to come back. So again, it's not this traditional, let's quick do a survey you know, after an acute um, episode. Instead, it's really about how do we create a bond between the way we interact as a, as a provider organization or as an insurance organization. Um, how do we create a bond that that person likes the experience and they want to stick with us? Um, so these are, these are interesting uh, trends setting up this new model. Um, this is the graph that you know, everybody's got to have one that you look at it and you say, that's really cool, um, but you can't read it and you're not really sure what it means. <laughs> and you know, um, you get the slides, you'll eventually get a chance to look at it. But the idea is to point out that we really do need to keep the patient or the family in the center of everything that we're doing. And that there's lots of different things that goes, go on around that. And the venues where care is provided or health is promoted are, are multifactorial, OK? But it does become about this more personal accountability and also that partnership with, with healthcare organizations and healthcare providers. Um, and then the outside circle is really the idea that there's lots of um, different kinds of information um, that actually ends up getting collected, and all of that is important. Um, so how many people are wearing or have worn a Fitbit? Yeah, so I heard a statistic that, I don't know if this is true, 50% of the people that put on a Fitbit stop using it within three weeks. And I said, gee, that's, that's not my experience. I don't know. Um, you know, I, I think it's a good example of how we as, as an, um, I don't know, almost as a species have kind of adapted. And I'm not saying everybody does their 10,000 steps, but everybody knows that they should. <laughs> right? And that's, that's a huge leap. That is, when you think about it, right? Everybody understands how important it is. 
And they kind of, you know, challenged themselves. Now, we just um, had a, a, IBM had a, had a big meeting, and so two groups challenged each other because they gave us um, the Fitbit. And you can see I don't have mine on because I still have my old one, which is clipped to my bra. Um, <laughs> And you know, it's another technology setup that I have to do to link it to my account, and I thought, I'll do that later. <laughs> you know, I do my, my gone with the wind thing. I'll think about that tomorrow. Um, but what's interesting, again, is that this idea of that personal accountability to take the steps. Because now this is something that's health-related that my doctor didn't tell me to do, that I have because of lots of reasons. Sometimes it could be peer pressure. Sometimes it could be I just know it's the right thing to do. Sometimes it could be I want to lose weight, right? But this idea that I'm going to do this for myself because it's the right thing, that's the beginning of this you know, responsibility that I think we're talking about um, in general. And I've got some things down that left-hand side that I think will just, you know, they're, they're more background information to this idea that we're moving to this, this really a different uh, kind of environment. So when I think about value-based care, I like to think about it in, in the two components of both the experience and the cost. Now, everybody's on this value journey. Um, how do you, you drive value from what you're doing? How do you make sure that you're being effective and efficient? So that's this, this thing on the left-hand side. And there's two ways of doing that. One is keeping your costs low, and the other one is making sure that your patient volume um, is, is high, so that you continue to be doing the things that people think are the right things to do, so you continue to have good uh, patient or, or consumer customer um, satisfaction and drawing those patients back. So I like to you know use this kind of an equation because I think it's a really important way of, of thinking about it. It's fairly simple when you get right down to it. Now when you're that staff nurse on that unit, you know, accepting that surgical patient or that ED admission, it doesn't always feel simple. And then, you know, depending on what computer um, type of device you're using or how far you have to move for it or whether or not you know you you feel like you've got the time that all impacts on that experience and so as we think about health IT I think it's important to think about this this fairly simple equation um, so there's lots of different pressures. I, I was listening to people this morning and at lunch, you know, what are you doing? Oh, I'm doing EHR, I'm doing ICD-10, I'm putting in barcoded MedAdmin. You know, there's so many things that, that take our attention, um, so many different kinds of, of things. Um, transitions of care, another really important one. So we used to just worry about handoffs within, you know, shift to shift within an individual organization, right? But now we're starting to think, if we're really gonna be patient-centric, we have to think about that care plan spanning outside the walls of the acute care facility into ambulatory care and home care. And a simple way of thinking about that if you're a hospital nurse is to think about the readmission rate and how we're gonna make sure that when the patient goes home, we're gonna prevent that readmission or that ED visit. But the more complicated way, again, is to think about you know, that continuum of health. And it's not just you know, making sure that this encounter goes smooth because the patient goes home and doesn't get readmitted, but when's their next appointment? Do they understand what they need to do related to the diet they're supposed to be on or the activity? Or do they really understand their medications? Um, and do they know where to call for help and what the support system is in the community? And those types of things. So that's really what, what this is, is talking about. And I think we've got some technologies um, that are the up and coming, and I have them listed here, the mobile again, Web and cloud technologies are really changing um, our opportunities in health IT. And you don't talk to an EHR vendor today who doesn't talk about moving to the cloud and using web-based strategies. Um, so even our legacy um, systems, like a, you know, a McKesson or a Cerner or an Epic or a Allscripts, all of them are talking about moving to um, the new platforms. And why? Well, one thing is related to the fact that you can do an upgrade very easily. So when we were talking with, um, when I was at the ONC, we talked with Athena Healthcare and uh, eClinical Works. Both are cloud-based, right? And it's like they don't have to roll out an upgrade to multiple customers, right? They change the software in the cloud and put in sort of on-off switches so you can turn on and off some of the newer features, and they're done and they walk away, and the customer can choose to implement those. Th 
completely different than what I was familiar with. And I've got experience in both Epic and Cerner. And I mean, we're talking trauma, right? Like six months of testing. And then, you know, we always had this thing during the testing, you know, fix one, break two. Yes. You've been there. I know you've been there. And, you know, so, and it's just because of the legacy system and the infrastructure. So similar to how mobile has transformed our personal lives, I think that, that cloud and web are going to transform our, our EHR uh, vendors. And we will be seeing products that I think are more, um, let's say, flexible. Now, in addition to the EHR, we've got this uh, problem in healthcare of um, unstructured data. And, and what I mean by that is definitely not, you know, getting everything codified and making sure that all your drop downs are, are locked and loaded and they're mapped to a, a LOINC code or they're mapped to a SNOMED code. What I'm really talking about is there's lots of verbiage. Um, so there's still a lot of dictation. And then there's um, escalating amounts of data, like genomic data, that is not going to be accessible through a traditional EHR. And so what this is basically saying is, uh, by 2020, we're going to have a lot of data. We're going to have new kinds of sensors and devices. We're going to have social media. Um, we've got a lot of um, hospitals, most, many, using VoIP now. So that's all going through the infrastructure. So this idea of unstructured data and just this explosion of data is really great. Um, and so we really need to start thinking about how are we going to harness that to make sure that we're not missing an opportunity in terms of, of learning. Okay, so a, a little bit about what um, I've been doing at IBM and how we think about um, some of these solutions. A lot of people have said to me today, by the way, I didn't even know IBM did healthcare. <laughs> and, you know, IBM moved out of um, a hardware quite a number of years ago, but really kind of finished off the majority of, of hardware probably five years ago. They don't even sell hardware anymore. So it's turned into a service organization as well as a platform. Um, so we'll do things like master data management, do things like analytics, middleware, if you will, um, integration services and things. And we do have industry focuses. So we have airline industry, we have retail industry as, as a couple examples. So I'm in healthcare industry and helping look at how do we take the solutions that we have and maybe have been very successful in other kinds of industries and incorporate those into healthcare. And so it, it's constantly, and many of you have those kind of roles too, I think, where there's, there's horizontal things, that would be vertical, okay. There's horizontal <laughs> things going on, there's vertical things going on, and you have to kind of manage that, that elbow, if you will. And so the same thing is true you know, at IBM. I'm an industry focus, and we'll make that, that vertical, um, but there's so many things like analytics where you can learn from, from other kinds of industries. And, and that's the, the power of a company, I think, of IBM, and that's kind of what drew me there. You know, um, I had spent, let's just say, a lot of years doing electronic health record implementation, 15 on, on Cerner and three on Epic. And um, you know, then when I went to the government, I thought, oh, this is it, you know, I'm gonna just be a policy wonk. And let's just say that didn't last real long. I was there for three years. <laughs> um, and then I thought, what am I gonna do for the rest of my career? And I kept, again, looking at that white space and saying, there's so much else that I wanna start thinking about and working around building on that infrastructure that's set with the EHR. And so um, in, in helping think about that healthcare, uh, we broke it down into three words, optimize, analyze, and engage. And I really do like these words. So thinking in the optimization, health system performance and optimization, doing what we need to do for patients and with patients in the most effective and efficient way. And we know we need to do that just because the money isn't going up, it's actually um, going down. And part of that certainly is determining which things should get done and which things don't need to get done. And you know, nurses are great at adding new things in, you know, like, oh, we should be doing this for that condition, so we add it in. We're less good at, at taking things away and really looking and saying, well, this is one of those things we probably can give up. You know, um, So I don't know, how many people as a registered nurse in their career have passed ice water? That is, requires a registered nurse, you know. <laughs> so it's a good example of something that we've given up, finally, thank God. Um, you know, I don't know if we thought that patients who were NPO were like going to sneak water. 
you know, what we thought. Um, there was certainly the infection control. I remember spending hours on the policies and procedures around that too. But I think it's a really good example of um, participative care, letting the family get the ice water when that's appropriate, or having, you know, uh, technicians uh, doing those kinds of things. But I think when it comes to assessments, as, as a good example, we're less likely to give up. We like that head to toe assessment five times a day, four times a day, three times a day. Um, and I don't know what we think we're doing because we know about the patient's condition. We understand the, the physiology and the pathophysiology and we should know which things we should be checking and which things not and when it's appropriate to do a head to toe and when it's not. You know, And our computers should be helping with that. But that kind of gets into the analysis. Um, it's going to make sense from a care management standpoint to start to look at what has an impact and what doesn't have an impact. And let's start tuning our profession and understanding better what works for patient falls, what doesn't work for patient falls. When should we be doing assessments? When shouldn't we? What about wound and skin care? Um, we, we still have a fair amount of um, research being done in those areas, so I don't mean to poo-poo that, but we have a completely different level of involvement when we can start looking at this kind of data and capturing it all electronically, even if it's unstructured, and what can we learn um, from those things. Um, and in addition to that, really then using that for po uh, population health insights. So taking what we can learn and, and applying it pretty specifically to different disease conditions. Um, so again, we know that, um, for example, diabetes, there's six things we should be doing for diabetes. Um, my, my mother, who is a diabetic in 88, reminded me of, of one the other day. And some of you might have heard me tell the story because I just think it's incredulous. But um, you know, she told me they were doing something new for diabetes now. And I said, really, what are they doing? She's in Wisconsin. I'm in Washington, D.C. I'm on the phone. And she said, well, they're checking your feet. <laughs> now, that's right up there with passing ice water, right? <laughs> you know, I think we've been doing that for a while, Mom. I, thinking, not saying, you know. And what was interesting that as a patient, she finally realized that that's what they were doing. Now, I don't even want to know if they were doing it before and she didn't notice. The point is she noticed they were doing it. And why? Because they engaged her in it and they talked to her about how important it was. And right, wrong, or indifferent, nobody had ever talked to her about that before. And so then the daughter guilt came on, like, why didn't I do that, you know? Um, but it, it's, uh, it's an interesting situation as we start to think about that patient engagement. And so I don't know if checking your feet is going to be one of the things that really sticks once we do further analysis on this. What I do know is that without a computer, best care, which is these six things for diabetes, is done about 20, 25% of the time today in this country. Um, and with a computer, it goes up to about 50%. You know, that's not something to be proud of, right? Um, and so we really do have to use our computer systems to get smarter and smarter. So not just to do the documentation, but to help us with the planning and to help us with the reminders and, and all those things um, up front. And I think that analysis is gonna help us hone those, thing, hone those things in and, and come up with the right kinds of things. And last but not least, and I've been kind of beating this one to death already, is, is patient engagement. So this is a little bit more complicated, and I'm guessing the people in the back of the room can't, can't um, read it real well. But it's as, as I was helping put together this sort of, um, what do we need to think about as we think about transforming health and healthcare and leveraging health IT beyond the EHR? These are the four categories I like to think about. And you already notice there's a wrapper around the outside with the dark green on the bottom that talks about in order to do these four things, we need data, we need analytics, we need cloud, we need security, and we need mobility. And I think mobility is important enough to be bolded and underlined. But the four categories, so at the top, really starting to think about patients as consumers and really thinking about not just those who have high deductibles are gonna be discerning you know, patients, but how do we tap into that and make them a big part of the solution instead of part of the problem? So I'm gonna ask another question. How many people have gone to a quick care, quick care or a minute clinic in the last five years? Yeah, a lot of us, right, including me. Why? It's quick. Yeah. Is it convenient? Oh, and there's a parking lot. You know, and you don't have to worry about going to that healthcare place 
parking someplace really far away or praying that they have valet parking, right? And you probably wouldn't use it even if they had it, but my point is that my, my mother would worry about that. Um, you know, and, and then navigating in and, oh, I used to register this way and now I register that way and wondering how long the wait was gonna be. I mean, there's even apps to determine how long the wait is in some of the EDs, for example, right? Um, so it takes away all that and it says, oh, this is just like anything else. And it's like buying any other service. Okay, so that's the beginning of it. That's the beginning of it. So I don't know if you went in the grocery store, you went in the, the drug store, you know, they're all fairly similar, fast and easy, right? In and out. And if there's a wait, they can tell you, like I went to one at Walgreens. Um, they told me, you know, the wait here is 15 minutes. If you want to go up the street, it's only five minutes away. There's no wait there. So they're all integrated and they can do those kind of cool things too. So it depends what's important to you at that time. You know, do I want to just sit here and rest or, you know, whatever. Um, but it, it's beginning to be that consumerism thing. Now, how many people heard about what Walmart's doing? So Walmart is going the next step, right? Walmart has said, mm-hmm, this is, this is good, but we want our primary care to be in our facilities. And so we're going to start with an employer-based clinic for our employees at Walmart. And within the next six months or so, they're opening up 17 primary care clinics in 17 Walmarts to provide services for their own employees. Now, you're familiar with employer-based clinics. There's other folks that have them. Again, I'm from Wisconsin. Quad Med was 10 years ago um, doing this. Very effective in this idea when you start to think about disease management and healthy behaviors, right? Because now you've got kind of a captive audience, right? But it's also easy because it's right on site. And so what Walmart wants to do is first do it for their own employees. Um, because again, insurance costs are going up. So they're saying, hey, we're just going to do our own thing. We're going to open our own clinics. We're going to have our own medical staff. And, and this will be interesting because it's going to pop open some of that traditional thinking, right? But if it's successful, they're going to offer this to small employers in their area where it might not be exactly on site, but it would be close enough as your local Walmart with regular parking lots and greeters when you come in the door, <laughs> right? Now, I, I just think this is what's going to shake everything up in terms of it'll be more like a regular experience. Because when we think about people like my mother or maybe every one of you, what are some of the barriers? Well, if there wasn't online scheduling, you might, how many people have online scheduling? A fair number, I hope. But what do you have to do? You have to call, right? And then what happens when you call? You're in a queue. You don't get through to anybody. And then you're trying to make this appointment, right? I mean, it just becomes this traumatic thing. And what do we like? We don't like phone calls anymore. We like texting. You know, we like online this. I mean, honest to goodness, I, I myself am finding myself doing that. If I can't book a hotel online, if it says you have to call or like a, um, a dinner reservation, I don't go there. I, I mean, you know, I just like my fingers do the walking, if you will. <laughs> um, new meaning of that. Um, so again, our behaviors are, are kind of interesting as we start to think about healthcare. Um, for many of our elderly population, you know, the trauma of that visit is in fact finding somebody to take them, the weight that they're going to have, and all those things. And so it's also going to be opening up this idea of, of telehealth, and I think that's just going to pop big time. I'm not talking about that uh, a lot today, but I think um, telehealth is going to really pop in the next. Um, three to five years in terms of something that we all accept. Um, okay, one more mom story because she's so funny. Um, she said to me, <laughs> this was more recently, this is the last few weeks, she says, I don't know, that pain doctor, you know, I really don't like going, he, he doesn't do anything. And I said, well, you know, he talks to you. He said, well, no, sometimes I have to talk to the nurse, she says to me. And I said, excuse me? <laughs> um, anyway, we got past the nurse part, but he doesn't, he doesn't actually like touch her. And she said, you know, like when I go to have my podiatrist do my nails. I mean, I don't mind paying for that. And I'm thinking, see, this is this understanding of something physical as compared to something more, um, and what's more important, cutting your toenails or having good pain control? You know, I, <laughs> but it's, it's interesting, again, that we're at least having the conversation and talking about the value that you get for the money that you're paying. And I think that's what folks are starting to talk about. So that's that whole top, um, expanding the consumer marketplace. On the left-hand side, building the care team of the future. Team-based care is, is 
is there. It's big time in the ambulatory care setting. You know, patients that are in medical home, you know, kind of crack the door. And I think nurse practitioners and, and registered nurses have walked right through and said, you know, we can manage certain kinds of patients. Research has shown we do a better job on, on certain kinds of, of patients and certain kinds of activities than anybody else. We can take the time to do um, certain activities. So how do we make sure that when we're doing that, that we're making sure that the whole is still maintained, meaning that we're communicating in a way that everybody still knows everything they need to know, right? And that you know the nurse isn't off doing this and the doc doing that and the dietitian doing that. Um, and so making sure that all the right processes are in place for that, that care team of the future. Um, on the right-hand side, we've got population uh, health. I like to think about that as really continuous improvement, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. That's kind of how I wrap up um, today. But to use this, this information that we're now collecting in our EHRs for a really important purpose, and that is to learn more about the care that we're delivering and what works and what doesn't work. And last but not least is optimizing and securing our, our value chain. So certainly thinking about our ERP solutions, our supply chain, those things that are, you know, how do we get supplies? How do we manage our pumps? What about RFID um, or, you know, location services? Kind of that infrastructure again within our organizations. And as we go into the home um, and we're deploying equipment in the home and, and following up, um, talking with an organization just a couple of weeks ago, again, um, and they were talking about taking a four-day length of stay down to a one-day length of stay. And the way that they were gonna do that was to give iPads to the patients that were having this particular procedure, it was a bone marrow transplant, um, so that they would have their care plan and could do the documentation of the activities that had to take place 24 to 48 hours before the procedure. That would be going into a database through the wireless cloud, you know, up there. I, I always think about things getting lost up there. In this case, we're not getting lost. And um, that the care providers would actually be monitoring their pre-op um, uh, activities um, through their document, through the patient's documentation on the iPad. They come in for 24 hours, they don't even stay overnight, and they go home and their care plan continues on, on the iPad while they're at home. And these, now we're talking about supplying the devices as an extension of the hospital, but it seems like a pretty cheap way to cut three days on a length of stay. And again, it appears that with these kinds of things, the outcomes are actually better, because all of those hazards of being in the hospital go away, as long as you have the right type of patient with the right support system. You know, this isn't something you can just you know, give to anybody. So patients are certainly being assessed. So I get excited about that kind of stuff. Um, so moving on to specifically talking about a mobile. Um, mobile is really being exploited for this anytime, anywhere access to data. So it really started as kind of a mini portal. You know, how do I get, how, can I look at my lab results? Can I do scheduling? Um, as, a, as a nurse, if I'm in a patient's room, um, can I get, the alarms being driven to my mobile device? Can I uh, use it to make phone calls? Um, can I use it to see tasks from my care plan? Consolidating it all to a device that I can slip in my pocket if it's something like an iPad mini or, a, or a, uh, an iPhone, um, as compared to going to a computer somewhere and having to, to log in. And again, using some of the like biometrics that they've got now for, for um, you know, uh, launching the uh, activities on your phone as compared to, again, that login and ID. Um, there hasn't been another study since the TCAB study, but you know, I think everybody remembers that was five, it was 5.2 miles a day in an eight hour shift that a nurse walks and the average duration in a room was two to three minutes. And so that's what I think we're trying to impact is not that in and out, in and out, in and out, because you're constantly, you know, as we've always called it, hunting and gathering. Um, and sometimes you're hunting and gathering for supplies, sometimes you're hunting and gathering for information, sometimes you're going out to answer the phone, you know, those kinds of things. Um, and so how do we really get that consolidated maybe onto a single device um, so that we can streamline that, that work of the nurse? Um, and other care providers, but here I'm really talking about nursing. Uh, developing new engagement techniques and health strategies with patients and consumers. So um, I remember back at Aurora when I was implementing the, the first patient entertainment system we had, we talked about um, having the patient's care plan for the day 
moving to that as well so that they could kind of see, oh, blood work's getting drawn and they're going for an x-ray and they're supposed to walk four times today. Oh, and by the way, toggle over here and you can watch a movie. And I remember having a couple of nightmares about that. Um, nightmares to the extent that I'd be reviewing a care plan with a patient and the movie that we put on hold to do that, you know, started up again. Or that I'd have to interrupt a movie to review the care plan with them and then I would be unable to get them back to the movie. This is a person who, you know, like me, who doesn't know how to program the VCR, right? Um, but I used to have little nightmares about that. And now when we think about it, how cool is it to think about sharing the care plan with the patient on a mobile device that they have access to so that they can keep track of what's going on with them. And I know, um, Patty, where are you? You were doing an iPad study, right? Uh, giving patients iPads. And maybe there's some other examples um, here too of folks that have been trying to do that and how that's the hook to get them patient, to get those patients engaged and to think about their care in a different way. Um, so using the technology is that engagement uh, uh, technique. And then the, the last thing there I have is gain insights to provide more personalized proactive interventions and bring analytics to the point of care. So once you're actually able to have that device, then you can also be driving things to the device based on, um, it could even be simple analytics like, um, you know I'm in this room and you know I'm the nurse that has these six patients. So if I'm in Mr. Jones' room and the IV is scheduled to run out in Mr. Smith's room, maybe I would want an alarm to pop up and say, you know that IV that you hung eight hours ago at 125 cc's hour, it's actually scheduled to run out. Um, you might want to go in there. Now, it's probably on a pump anyway, and you're going to get the pump alarm. But my, my point being that you can really think about some of those very simple sorts of reorganizations of tasks that I think will be helpful um, when we've got those devices in our pockets. Um, and so here's just some examples of, of uh, applications that I've actually been working on. Um, we have a partnership, IBM Apple, and uh, we're developing some what we're calling groundbreaking applications for both acute care and home care. Obviously, the one on the right it, with the house picture. Um, but the idea here is, again, to exploit the power of the phone and to take some of the things that you use in other aspects of your lives and incorporate them in. So the idea with the home, just as an example, um, this is, uh, was developed for the value proposition of preventing readmissions. And so there's quite a number of organizations now that are starting to talk about going out and doing home visits to follow up on the discharge instructions and the care plan once a patient returns home. And using analytics, of course, most organizations know what 10, 15, or 20% of their patients are at risk for readmission. So you don't have to go out and visit all patients who are discharged. You visit those 10 or 15%. And then following up on their care plans, on their medication regimens. So if they're going to get three visits, uh, at the first visit, you snap a quick picture of the house so that the next nurse that comes along the second time doesn't have to spend all the time when the address isn't really obvious or whatever. Just a very simple example. And then on this right-hand side, you can see that the um, uh, care coordinator's name is Joel, and you can send a quick text, you can phone, or you can um, use the star, which actually shows uh, resources in the area. So the same way we find a Starbucks when we're in a foreign land and um, want to know where the closest Starbucks is, right? Um, okay, that's the part that I use. Um, <laughs> I love my Starbucks in the morning. Um, but again, these are really workflow enablers. You know, it's not replacing the EHR. It's taking and helping augment those things and really replacing the piece of paper that the nurse took notes on during shift handoff. Um, and, you know, when are the meds for a particular patient and, and when are the treatments for a particular patient? When's their IV going to run out? Those kinds of little notes that are often still kept on paper. Um, putting that into a small device that's in your pocket that can alarm, um, and then integrating all of your alarming, your telemetry, your bed alarms, your call light system, so that, and that's what's on the left-hand side there, the top are the alarms, and at the bottom are those tasks that came off of the care plan, and they're just those little reminders, so in other words, it doesn't tell you what medication and what dose and what amount, it simply says Mr. Jones has a med at nine o'clock, um, so it's not replicating the EHR, it's just augmenting the workflow of the nurse. And what's cool about that particular one, you see, maybe you can't even read it, it says my patients and then it has the patients listed so you can go in patient by patient. But if I swipe this way, it brings it up in, across my patients in timed order. 
so that you can look at everything due at 8 o'clock and at 8.15 and at 8.30 and at 9 o'clock across your patient assignment as compared to just looking by patient. So again, just simplistic ways that I think in general we can look at augmenting um, the nursing workflow and get that time in the room to go up and the number of steps walking. Of course, maybe we don't want to bring it down, but okay, you know. <laughs> Because um, we know that's good, but it takes away from patient care with, with all of the walking. So maybe we can walk to work in the morning instead. Um, okay, so that's kind of mobility. It's opening up a, a whole new category. And, and then as we get into this idea of um, this patient engagement, what, what people are really looking for is, I want you to know me, I want you to engage me, and then I want you to empower me. And not everybody is activated at all three levels. Not all patients are totally into the Empower Me category. But as nurses, I've always felt if, if this is gonna change, there's one way it's gonna change with our patients, and it's through us, and by us talking to them about the change and how it's a good thing that they get engaged and understand their care while they're with us so they can manage their care when they're not with us. You know, this isn't us not wanting to do stuff. This is us understanding how important it is for them to be part of um, things like shared decision making. Um, you know, nurses continue, again, uh, to be the most trusted um, profession. And I think, again, we're, we're empowered um, to help our patients in, in this category and understand why it's so important to, to get engaged in this way. So again, I, I kind of talked about this, um, the upper left one, I think you know the symbol targets opening up clinics as well. Um, there's are probably initially going to be more like minute clinics, um, but I wouldn't be surprised that everybody's watching the Walmart experience um, to see how, th how that goes. Um, I kind of like the idea, I, I was thinking about like Starbucks again, you know, if I could just bop in and have my blood pressure checked and <laughs> while I'm waiting in line for 10 minutes, which is fundamentally against everything I believe in. Um, but I do it because I want my coffee, you know. Um, but it, it, <laughs> it, it becomes more part of your life, and that's what I'm really trying to say. It becomes more part of your life rather than I live and then I go do this little healthcare thing. And then I live, right? It's empowering and engaging and making sure that we're all really about the same thing. Lots and lots and lots of activity around this. Um, we increasingly, we IBM, we um, you know, get contacted from insurance companies, for example. They're vested in this because, again, the less time people spend in the hospital, the less um, time they um, develop complications, the more time they manage their chronic conditions well, that's good for everybody. You know, and so we have to start thinking about that value word. What is going to be the value? Um, and maybe for an asthmatic, it stays away from work. You know, it's not are you controlled with an inhaler or medication. It's how many days away from work are you really having? And how does that change when you're under good control? Um, so that's the kind of uh, quality metrics and, and value metrics I think we're going to be looking at. Um, so consumerism in healthcare, there's, there's cost shifting. I mentioned that already when I talked about high deductible plans, we've got out of pocket. Um, and, and so what we're really doing is becoming a more discerning consumer. You're starting to think about it. You might not change too much, but you're at least thinking about it. And many people have actually started um, changing. So I've got a video. Um, I hope Mary's here to tell me how to run the video. <laughs> There she comes. Um, I bet I have to escape out of here and hit something else. And, and this is just an example of how life could be. Um, and I thought a video, it's just short. Okay. Oh, it was right on the desktop. Thank you. No problem. You might have to open the PowerPoint here. I think I closed it. Hello. I'm Julia Norris and I live in New York with my husband and our daughter. While I'm away on business, I receive a call from my daughter's teacher who notices that she is having trouble catching her breath at recess and suggested a doctor visit. Right from my tablet, I will book an appointment for my daughter using my health plan engagement app. After logging in securely, my personalized dashboard gives me direct access to my primary health care network. Here, I can easily view my GP's details. If necessary, I can use the map to find physicians in my family's area. 
I can also use the advanced search feature to find urgent care locations by entering keywords or by clicking Find Me, which brings up nearby doctors. Finding a doctor, I can now seek advice and book an appointment with their office through video or text chat with an Uber assistant for doctors. by easily relaying my health insurance information using the digital ID cards. which I can swipe through in full screen mode. I receive a confirmation of the appointment in my inbox, as well as messages when my doctor provides a prescription for my daughter. From my prescription center, I can manage all of my family's medications, find out more information, and locate pharmacies. Reassured about my daughter's health, I use my healthy life to check my own current health status in relation to my community, my family, and my friends. This health plan engagement app has transformed the way I engage with our healthcare providers. I have the peace of mind of being able to take care of my family's health from wherever I am. Just interesting, huh? Some of the things, integrating all this into one, Hello. one approach. Hello, I'm Julia oh, Norris, and I live in New York with my husband <laughs> and, and my And it's daughter. raining. I have no idea the significance of that. While I'm away on business, I receive a call from my daughter's teacher, I know, I'm who to notices that, that she is having trouble catching her breath at recess, <laughs> and suggested a doctor visit. Come on, come on. Right from my tablet, I will book an appointment for my daughter using my health care. <laughs> After logging in securely, my personalized dashboard gives me direct access to my primary healthcare network. Woo! I bet you liked it better the second time, too. Let's see. All right. Where are we toward the end, I suppose? Yeah, just. Yeah. Uh, there. So moving a little bit to talking about this end-to-end -end integration, um, similar to what was shown, and that was you know, certainly a, a home or consumer-based example as compared to an acute care. But really this ability to integrate data and the circles there are showing, you know, integrating the nurse's brain with the information on the wall with the thing in her pocket. Um, by the way, if, just for, for kicks, I, uh, we've been talking a lot about uh, integrating into one device. And so I was thinking about tool belts the other day and I Googled nurses' tool belts. You want to have a kick? Yeah, do that. Woo, there's a lot of interesting things out there. No, 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 no. I mean, like real tool belts, like with six pockets that are different colors and stuff. Yeah, I know where you are going. <laughs> but at least now everybody's awake. Um, so I, I really only have one minute, even though I started late. Can I finish? Can I have five minutes? Okay, good. Thanks, Denise. You are the, you are the award winner, so we'll go with that. Um, understanding this, this care and, and what we're providing and what creates value and doesn't create value is going to be really important. I think everybody agrees that our quality metrics today, they're process measures, they're better than not having anything at all, but they're not where we need to be. And analytics is really going to be the way to, to uh, get there. Um, so big data hopefully has taken on a slightly new meaning for you as I showed that graphic with all the, um, not just genomics data, but all of our device data and things. Um, imagine all your Fitbit data, all your health kit data, all your research kit data. You know, it just starts getting bigger and bigger in terms of what's going on in, in the world. We were talking about PowerPoints and, you know, how um, you know, a, a meg file used to be big and now it's like 15 meg, 20 meg. This particular one's 22 as an example. I mean, you know, it's, they're, they just, everything's getting bigger. And, and to think once you have all that data, then how are you actually going to optimize workflow and what's that user interface going to be? So in thinking about analytics, most organizations um, and uh, think about this in, in four levels, from basic reporting 
and you've got kind of the definition of that. Many of you are probably getting reports of some nature today that talk about different aspects of, of the care that's provided in an organization or um, for a particular type of patient um, population. But moving out of that basic reporting into what's considered you know, foundational analytics. So using the reporting to say, well, who's at risk and what's happening? So for example, when I was talking about visiting those patients who are at risk for uh, readmission, that's probably a foundational analytics report. So you've, you've looked at some parameters and kind of whittled it down um, to what um, that significant population that you want to be focusing on. But getting into this next level is predictive and prescriptive. Um, so that's where we start to say, based on the history of what we've seen, now let's talk about what we think could be happening in the future. How are we going to be predictive and that's where and I have this listed on the bottom you know population health analytics actually come in um, now that is a completely different thing than cognitive computing which is in the upper right hand corner so cognitive computing is not programmed these first three are programmed okay if then else you're telling the computer what you want to look at and having it pull those things out for you when you get into cognitive computing, that's where you not only have natural language processing going on, but it actually is learning from itself. So Watson, for example, is cognitive computing, and um, it takes both knowledge-driven methods and data-driven methods for this cognitive approach. So knowledge in a simplistic way, and that's when it played Jeopardy, that's what it did. It looked at all the information and it ingested it and was using that to understand what was all written in research and written in articles. And in the case of Jeopardy, previous Jeopardy shows what was in the dictionary, what was in the encyclopedia, okay? So that's knowledge driven, so it's published. And I think you all know, nobody can keep up with this anymore. And so using a Watson-like cognitive computing um, to do those kind of analytics just simply makes sense. But what's really going to be important is to take that knowledge that comes from the population averages and apply it to insights for individual patients. And that's also going to be cognitive. So some of the early healthcare Watson things are really about looking at specific diagnoses and clinical trials and matching individual patients up to logical clinical trials and predicting the percent um, uh, uh, success rate for that particular thing. So a, an actual cognitive, um, like oncology at uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering, they would look at the, the type of tumor that a patient has, all the literature and all the success that's been documented in the literature and clinical trials, and match those things up to say for this patient, this is probably the therapy because it's got an 80% probability of success. Here's a secondary one that has a 70% chance of success. And then, of course, that would give the patient and the practitioner through a partnership to look at those two and look at, well, what are the side effects of that treatment protocol? What are the uh, criteria for it being included if it is a clinical trial? And make an informed decision between those things. So that's the kind of things that are going on, kind of marrying this left-hand side and right-hand side. So it's not just about knowledge that's known from, from uh, research and that's documented in literature, which is in fact being ingested into a Watson-like um, computer, but it's also then applying that to the data that we know. And that's why the right-hand side becomes really important because that's how we actually make this super meaningful for individual patients and for individual patient care. Okay, now the left mouse click isn't working anymore because Mary <laughs> screwed this up. Um, I blamed you again. Um, so here's kind of the progression as an organization thinks about moving from I, I'm collecting information and probably your major source in that lower left-hand corner is, is uh, the electronic health record and moving up sort mining that data, putting up dashboards, then you got the big data predictive, pull in patient similarity things, natural language processing, and finally the cognitive computing. Um, and just to give a sense of timing, so, you know, tabulating, that was back at the turn of the, into the 20th century, at 1900s. Um, programmable systems era started in 1950. Um, you know, I think healthcare is probably at 1955, um, whereas the rest of the world is in 2015. Um, you know, we're, we're still behind the curve just even in those programmable things. But the cognitive systems era has just begun. 
And so just be aware when folks are talking about what's, and it's not magic. You know, a lot of people think it, in magic, somehow it's taking, you know, information and it can play Jeopardy. It, it actually is using a methodical process to learn based on what it's reading, if you will. And it gets better and better when its corpus starts to grow. So the more a Watson-like system is used and the successes are understood, it iterates itself and actually gets better. Which leads me into, I'm mean, going to skip that. I was just saying we're in that era right now. We're learning and reasoning and interacting naturally. Uh, you know, Siri kinds of interfaces um, make a bunch of sense. So this is really my, my last slide. Um, why is this so important? Well, we need to become a learning health system. And we need to be able to learn at a pace that's something different than whether you ascribe to the seven years to move things from research into practice in healthcare, or whether you ascribe to the 17 years, or something in between, we know it's not one year. And so the idea here is that we can quickly learn. Now this was actually, or a diagram similar to this was spelled out by the IOM report uh, most recently as um, you know, the crossing the quality chasm was like 15 years ago, and the IOM in 2012 put out a new report, and they said, what's happened since that to air as human and crossing the quality chasm? And what they found out is everybody understands quality is really, really, really important, but nothing's changed in healthcare. Um, and so they put forth a diagram similar to this, I've adapted it a little bit, to say we have to start learning at a quicker pace, and we have to start understanding how we iterate ourselves. So again, this basically is saying um, we're going to build evidence out of practice on the upper left-hand side, and we're going to incorporate it into our electronic health records and other health IT so that we can make it easy to do the right thing, so that we can then monitor our practice and the impact that that practice change has had, and then we can look at that through analytics and iterate that back into practice. So changing our order sets, changing our documentation templates, changing the way things, uh, the way we present things actually will have a huge impact in practice. And to really start to think about the compilation of everything that I said today, I think is in this one diagram of becoming a learning health system um, where we can actually learn by what we do at a pace that's, that's like no other. And with that, I will wrap up, and I probably don't have time for questions. <laughs> one question. We waited long enough, I got it up to two. So now two people do have to ask questions. There's one. Yeah, that's an interesting question. You know, wearables, um, you know, there's been, a, there's pictures of that on the internet too, if you want to look, um, in terms of things hanging around your neck or things, because I think you're not talking about wearable to understand my own body, right? Body sensors. Yeah. So the Apple Watch, we have four applications already on the Apple Watch. Um, <laughs> Now, part of, part of the problem is if, if it's not a, a watch application that was natively written by Apple for the watch, and I will tell you this is something you probably don't know, you have to have an iPhone or an iPad close by because now the watch is an extension of the application on the phone or the iPad. So again, no big magic. Now maybe, you know, version two is going to be able to be freestanding. Um, so you would still have to have an iPhone or an iPad in your pocket. But there's three different functions that it, it basically does. It can alarm you, um, and it would be like a, a physical thing. It'll give a little buzz like when something important, and then you could look, okay? Um, and you can clear it by just flicking, flicking your wrist. And anybody wants to buy me one so I can practice this, feel free. <laughs> Should have been given one away. <laughs> And by the way, you cannot go to the store and buy one, interestingly. They are only delivering them through, through mail order at this point. The, the stores do not have any of them. Um, so yeah, I think there's possibilities there, I, totally. But I don't think we know enough about it to know the nurse's tolerance of it and what the best way to do it. And again, the apps that we've created are more demonstration types. Nobody's actually used them yet. Um, so it'll be interesting to see, but I, I like that idea. You know, I, I really do, because it'll be a quick like flick of this or, or a glance at that. They call them glances, too. Um, and you can see certain things. Oh, I'm only getting one. OK, thank you.
Yeah. So questions about patient-generated health data. And uh, when I was at the ONC, we did a lot of work on, on thinking about that. And everybody agrees it needs to get done. But the next question is, how should it go in there? Um, should it be structured or unstructured? Should it be integrated with the rest of the information in there? I think most people know that today, if you consume a, a, a CCD or a, a CDA that's incoming from a different electronic health record, it doesn't actually integrate in with the data that's already in there. So if a blood pressure comes in, oh, bam, it doesn't go on your, your blood pressure flow sheet, for example. It's held in that other document. Um, and so there's a question about the consumer-generated data and how integrated it should or shouldn't be. And then there's a concern about what they call provenance, keeping track of where it came from. So if we do start to integrate the data, um, let's say you're the patient, I'm the practitioner, you sent data to me, and it's now in, in uh, my, the physician's electronic health record, nurse's electronic health record. And now you're going to, as a patient, to another provider, and I take that and I package it up and I send to them. I have to maintain ownership of that data to know what data was created by you versus what data was created by me when I send it to practitioner two. And then correspondingly, practitioner two is gonna send it to practitioner three potentially if we're really talking about integration, right? And so maintaining that provenance is probably one of the biggest issues that we've been talking about with patient-generated health data. And then there's the governance of it, like if you send data to me and I choose not to look at it, am I liable for that data that was in there, right? So that's more the governance and how we're going to quote unquote mandate or recommend um, that data is actually used. But we're having the right conversations. It's not gonna happen overnight. But um, there is some dabbling of patient-generated data in a stage three meaningful use. Okay, thank you again.